And if you will turn to our Old Testament reading, 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 10 through 17. This is the word of the Lord. But David's heart struck him after he numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days' pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of, of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, when David spoke to the Lord. When he, then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Thus far, the reading of God's Word from the Old Testament. If you'll turn now to our New Testament reading and the sermon passage this morning, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life 
for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please pray with me. Lord, we pray for our eyes and our hearts to be opened up to your word. Lord, that you would be with us here present by your spirit. That we would be built up, that we would be strengthened, that we would be convicted where we need convicting. Lord, that you would be made manifest, that you would be lifted up in glory for the great grace that we have, that we see here through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last Sunday evening, we spoke on just a few of these verses, and I was reminded of a time when I worked at a charity in my hometown. I went home on my break from college, and I'd go and work at this charity where people would bring in all of these items to be donated and they would come in and they'd be set in in boxes, and sometimes we would have to go pick them up. And we would take this box truck and we would drive over and all these donations would be filled in from some location or another, and it would come back to the charity where some of the items would be used either in housing or they would be sold in in the shop to, to raise funds. And I never understood the qualifications for what was sold in the shop, what was put into a house, and what was left in the truck or moved to another truck to be driven to the dump. I was astounded by the amount of donations that just became instantly trash. Uh, And I would take something off and I would show it to the older man who was in charge of determining this is trash and this is treasure, And I would show him this VCR, and I was like, should we plug it in? Should we check it out? And he says, no. Nobody's going to buy that. Nobody's going to use that. That goes to the dump. That stays on the truck. Even though that might have been of greater value than the glass paperweight that he wanted, it was garbage because it was on the truck that was going to the dump, and it was going to be thrown into the dump, and it would be refuge. It would be thrown away. Its, its personal value didn't have an effect in relation to the other things in the truck. And so uh, it was my job just to lift and carry things to, do I take this into the shop or do I move this over here? You tell me what to do with it. But anything that remained on that truck was garbage. Because even if the mattress was in good condition, even if that, uh, that picture in the frame was just as good as when it was first made, if it was in that truck, it was going to be driven to the dump and it was going into the garbage. And so if it was on that truck, it was garbage. Just by virtue of where it stood inside that truck. Now, if something were to be taken off that truck and moved to a different place, it may be of the same value in my own estimation. It's not better or worse in my estimation. But because it got moved into the warehouse or because it got moved into housing and used, it was not garbage. Not because it was worth more than the other things, but because it was placed into the warehouse to be sold, it was worth something. Because it was placed into the house to be useful, it was worth something. We read here of Adam and Christ and who we are and what we are by virtue of where we are placed. We arrive in a truck called Adam, this man who has sinned in the Garden of Eden, who has sinned against the Lord and has brought sin and death to all the world. And so all who are in him, all who are in that truck, is destined 
for the dumb. But it is only those who are taken out of Adam and placed into something else by virtue of where they are placed have value and have life and have usefulness. And so Paul here is doing a compare and contrast of death in Adam and life in Christ. Sinfulness that we have in Adam and righteousness that we have in Christ by virtue of who we are in. Paul starts saying, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, I'm going to stop right there. He says, just as, and then he describes what happened under Adam. Just as in this case, when Adam sinned, sin was spread to everybody. Everybody who comes after Adam has sin in them because of who Adam is. And because they have sin, they have death. Everybody who comes after Adam has sin and death, no exceptions. But he starts that with the phrase, just as. Whenever you hear the phrase, just as, you should be expecting to hear, so also. Just as Adam, something, 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 so also. But if you continue reading, you're not seeing a so also. In fact, you don't see a so also all the way until verse 18. Because Paul is explaining this, and he's going into detail and detail and detail, and even comparing and contrasting, but then he revisits this just as, again, in verse 18. He says, therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to the justification in life for all men. This is the so also that is being set up in Paul's argument, just as as through one man sin came into the world and death through sin, so, verses and verses later in verse 18, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. That is the distinction that we're seeing here. They are so similar, Adam and Jesus. One man And all are sinners and inheriting death. One man, and you have righteousness to inherit. You have life to inherit. Here's the contrast and the comparison. But first, before he actually puts them together, as we're tracing through this, he wants to expand more on who this Adam was and what this state of sin and death is. Just as one man... Sin came into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. This is, he's going into an aside. He says, he kind of steps out, it's kind of a parenthetical statement. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression. What is going on here? What is his argument? Because it sounds like he says to start, sin is inherited by everyone through Adam, and sin and death that follows it. But then he says something strange. He says, for sin was in the world before the law, before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the time between Adam and the giving of the law to Moses. So Adam had a law in the Garden of Eden. He, was, he said, do not eat of that tree or you will surely die. That's the law. And he disobeyed that law. But we don't have another law given for the rest of the people for generation after generation until Moses. And Moses receives the law, and it is clear what God demands. And so when he says, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. So what does it mean that it's not counted? 
It's kind of a, a word meaning to bill or invoice. It's not, uh, it's not written down and accounted for in a certain, in a, in a certain way. Does that mean that all the people between Adam and Moses never died, that their sin wasn't really sin? No. No. It said, for sin was in the world before the law. Even though the law wasn't there, there is sin. And even though the law wasn't there, there is death. He continues on. This is not a point against his argument. This is a point in support of his argument. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though there wasn't a law, even though there, there wasn't an invoice or a bill of accounting, death and sin still reigned because all of the people after Adam still had sin. They inherited sin. They sinned in Adam. They die in sin. They die in Adam. This is his argument. We, all of us, are in Adam. We're in that box truck that's going to the dump. All of us. It doesn't matter what law you have been given. We are in Adam. That is our estate. We're going to the dump. We need someone to move us out of that truck. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. When Paul says the word type here, that word is like a, uh, a stamp. That is a, uh, something that you would uh, maybe press into uh, clay, or you may be familiar uh, with uh, stamps, or you dip it into ink, and you press it on the paper. Uh, our son has some stamps, and you, know, you have a, a little train, and you dip it in the ink, in the blue ink, and then you put it on the paper, and you get a little blue train. But when I look at the train, and then I look at the paper, I, I, I turn the stamp up towards me, the train is facing right in my hand. But the train here on the paper is facing left. It's opposite. It reminded me when I went to college, my best friend and I, when we were going off to different colleges, we bought old typewriters at the Goodwill so that we could write each other hand-typed uh, letters because I don't know why we did that. We were kind of nerdy and, and uh, you know, we had computers. Um, but I noticed on the typewriters, the letters that would go forward and punch the page, all the letters were backwards. They're not forwards, they, they're the mirror image so that when they hit the paper with the ink, it's forward then. And so that's, that's what we're seeing in this type. It's the exact thing, but it's opposite. And so that makes a lot of sense when, when Paul is saying, well, this is like that, and then he's saying, but it's not like that. Because what is that mirror image and what is that stamp? It is exactly the same except that it's completely opposite. It's completely reversed. It's the very opposite, in fact. If you look at it, any mold to, to make an object to be injected with uh, plastic, or if, you, uh, if you're minting coins, if you see what they're using to mint a quarter, you can look at your quarter and, and say, oh, this looks exactly like that. This is the same. I see it. It's the same thing, except that it's completely different. In fact, it's opposite, because where George Washington's face comes up, his face goes down in that mold. And, and where the letters are, are re reading forward here, they read backwards there. And I can see that it's the same. I can see that they match. But in reality, they're exactly the opposite in every way. And so Adam was the type of the one to come in this way, and we'll see how that works out. He starts to contrast this immediately. We haven't even got to the just as, but he's contrasting already the type of the one who, is, who was to come, being Jesus Christ. But the free gift is not like the trespass. 
For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. I remember reading this verse in high school and being so confused because it says everybody dies through Adam. Everybody, all 100% of people inherit death and sin through Adam. If many died through one man's trespasses, much more have. And I'm just stopping there and I'm thinking, much more have the grace of God. And I just don't read on to the end of the sentence and I'm thinking, how can you have much more than everybody? That doesn't make any sense. Much more. It's because I didn't finish the sentence. If many have received much more, not in terms of quantity of people, much more, and the object of that being the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. For many. The number of people is different. The number of people is, is many. It's not everybody, it's many. But the thing that is abounding up and above and beyond and more is the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ. That is abounding above and beyond and more than the death and the sin that is inherited by man, by Adam, by a human being. And of course, why wouldn't it be? Because it was an error of a man, of a human. But the gift is wrought, conceived, and worked out by God himself through his only begotten Son, applied by his Holy Spirit. How could it not be all the more, much more abounding, that gift so far and above the death that we receive in Adam. And so much more does God's grace abound than death and sin which we have been born in. We see that the free gift is not like the trespass because it's exactly the opposite. It's the reverse. It's the mirror image. Because Adam started in innocence, and through one trespass, one sin, all became sinners. But the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. If you can see innocence up to the point of Adam in one sin, and you see sin is now, sin and death are now proliferated to everybody. And you have the accounting that you're able to invoice because we have a law now and see all of the sins of the world and, and all of the death that has been accrued up until this point. And then Christ comes to earth, the perfect spotless lamb of God, not born from an earthly father, but from a heavenly father. Not inheriting Adam's sin, but having his own perfect righteousness. He does one righteous act of sacrificing himself, taking our sins upon himself, and by that one righteous act, the thousands, the millions, the trillions of sins that came before him are undone and made righteous by his one act. We can see that it looks very, very much like Adam. It looks, you can look at this and say, hey, that's like Adam, that's just like him, except completely different, completely opposite. The perfect mold the perfect stamp, the perfect mirror image to what has just happened. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace 
and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The wording here can sometimes be a little confusing, but this verse brings a lot of clarity that the promise that is given through Christ is not salvation for every single human being. Though the sin of Adam brought sin and death to every single human being, the righteousness of this one man abounds all the more for those who receive it. Not for every single human being, but for those who receive it. And this lines up very well with the rest of Paul's theology as he lays out the significance, the importance of having faith. You cannot go to God without faith. There are some who will have faith and have life, and there are some who will not have faith, and they will not have life. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. I made that point very clearly because we read those words and the contrasting between Adam and Christ, it says, leads to justification and life for all men. But this is not the complete application of justice and justification in life to every single human being, but to those who receive it. And he makes that more clear in the, net, in the parallel that he repeats. He says, for as by the one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And so you can see he's just using parallel language there. He's using that kind of rhetorical flourish to make it sound the same um, but seeing this and reading it in context, we see that this is not an argument for universalism, but rather the abundance of the salvation is given to those, is, is in terms of the quality that is given to those who receive it, not into the quantity of persons who receive it. Now, this is verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It was apparent that sin was already there before the law. Paul points that out early on. Sin and death were in the world before the law was given. But the law comes now, we see, coming back full circle. The law, again, being brought up. The law came in to increase the trespass. If you look at your hands and you don't have anything on them, they seem quite clean. There's no, I don't see any little microscopic organisms on my hands. And so why should I, why should I wash my hands before going into surgery or, or preparing the meal? I mean, there's nothing on them. I don't have a, I don't see anything. So, so I should just not worry about that, right? But if we take a much, 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 much closer look. If I was to take a swab from my hand and put it in a little Petri dish and set it there for a little time, and I was to turn the microscope closer and closer and closer, I could see that my hand is not fully empty. There's lots of stuff on my hands that aren't apparent to me because I don't have a framework for seeing them. I don't have a tool for seeing them. And so they existed there already, but they weren't seen. It was already there. Sin was already in the world, and sin and death was already in the world. But the law came in to increase it, to magnify it, to show it as it really is, to make it larger, and so we know that it's there, that we may be convicted and convinced of our sins. The law came to increase the trespass. 
But while sin increased and is magnified and is blown up and we can see it so clearly, we're not crushed with the hopelessness of it. Because as sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All of us are born on that truck headed to the dump. We are brought into the charity, and we have a destination already set. It is only by the intervention of a Savior, of somebody coming to change our identity and what and who we are by taking us off of the thing that makes us garbage and putting us somewhere that means that we have a purpose, that we have value, that we have usefulness. And it's not because we are better than our neighbors or smarter than our neighbors or more beautiful than our neighbors because that picture frame just looks just as good as that paperweight. It's not our value that saves us, but the free gift, that desire of God to show us grace, that he would pour out his mercy on you, no better than your neighbor, to lift you up out of the place of destruction and to place you in his Son, in Jesus Christ, You have not changed what you are yourself, but because you abide in something different, you now are something different. Sitting on that truck, you would never be useful a day in your life, and eventually you will be thrown in the dump. But placed into the warehouse, placed into a home, your future changes. You can become useful through what Christ is doing in you. You are now have a purpose. You now have a new identity because of where you are placed. You are in something different, and now your identity and destiny are different. This is exactly like we have seen what we saw happen through Adam, yet completely opposite, and far and above all the greater. This is the grace that we have in Jesus Christ, that he came to this world, that he died for our sins, that we, through no merit of our own, may have salvation in him. And so let us praise his name. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your word, for your graciousness to us. Lord, we confess that you are worthy of all praise because This salvation is beyond what we could have made for ourselves. It is beyond what we could have conceived. Lord, we pray that this truth would be implanted deep in us, that we may bow before you with praise, with glorying to you because of the great work that you have done in Christ. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.